Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to talk about quant secrecy and how it somewhat compares to academia. Um, so this is actually coming from a discussion board if you were interested in quantitative finance discussions. Uh, somewhat fairly interesting discussions in my opinion. Um, I'll put a link below and you can actually check out. It's a private quant finance dis discussions group on LinkedIn uh, that I co-run with somebody else. Um, recently I've mentioned it, we've had a bunch of people from YouTube and like, this channel in general jump on there. Uh, we've had a few questions, not a ton, but we've had a few. Um, again, some interesting insights on here. Not a lot of people are answering, but we do have a few professionals that are kind of giving feedback. Uh, and today's question is going to come from Sergio. And the question I think is fairly interesting, fairly dynamic, and fairly challenging to answer because this really leads me into this explosion of like 500 different quant topics from careers um, to basically how things work, to academia, to why quant finance is broken from the fundamental core, uh, all kinds of issues here. But I'm gonna try to streamline the response here. If you wanna see my four post <laughs> response to this, uh, jump over on LinkedIn and you can see that. So the question is coming from an academic background where things work by the fact that all new knowledge is openly shared, um, of course, you know, if we ignore the fact that 99% published is basically unreproducible, kind of BS, nonsensical stuff, uh, I wonder how the same principles applies to the quant finance world. Uh, in particular, I have the perception that it is, in fact, secrecy, uh, often enforced by contractual clauses that give quants an edge. Would you openly share your newest money-making model, right? Kind of like, of course not. Uh, and then secondly here, I wonder what is the motivation for quants to openly discuss ideas with others when the very discussion could potentially diminish your edge in the market. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm very eager to discuss things I've got in mind, but I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about the, basically this question here. So this is kind of taking into the whole consideration this kind of, you know, you or LinkedIn form here. Uh, we don't get a ton of interaction on here. And this is actually a good point, right? A lot of people perhaps just don't want to talk about it. Uh, but I would actually say that trading strategies and all this, I don't know, I'm going to call it hype, is things that are just basically not talked about because it's most of it's BS. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit here in a second. So let's start off with here why quants would share something. So that's going to be kind of taking the question apart from a different angle here. Uh, the first main thing is, I mean, imagine you come across some really interesting, groundbreaking new thing, right? Uh, you could keep it secret and you could try to trade on it, um, but kind of the rule of finance as well is if you can't basically scale things in finance to a very, very large sum and make large money off of it, it's not typically the best thing. So for example, say an individual comes up with an amazing idea, right? Uh, you'd have to pitch it to a bunch of different people. You'd have to keep it super secretive. Uh, you'd have to pitch it to the right firms, have non-competes in place and all this other nonsense. Uh, a lot of large firms might even just wane out non-compete contracts if there's any timing around that. It's a whole other legal issue. Uh, but in general, you'd have to kind of find someone that had a lot of money to utilize it, right? Uh, you're not going to find something that's so groundbreaking either that's going to be like, you can take your $5 and make $10 million out of it. Um, I love seeing all these stupid ads I get on uh, YouTube as well. And like, you know, you don't need millions of dollars. You can be a millionaire overnight. All you need is five bucks. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of absurd. Uh, but in general, the reason you would share it though is you'd want the publicity behind it, right? So even though you're thinking like, oh, you could cash in on a trading idea. Um, one, the biggest issue is trading ideas only last for a very short period of time. And even if you discover something and you trade off of it, even for a longer period, let's say six months to a year or something, uh, eventually other sorts of algorithms will pick it up. Other sorts of traders will figure out different angles of your strategy. They don't even need to know the entire thing. Uh, and often markets will correct themselves fairly quickly uh, and you will lose your edge. So as many of you, I don't know, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, uh, this is why you have a whole team of quant researchers or quant model developers. Uh, they're developing models and strategies because guess what? Markets are super dynamic. And so you have to build something and you trade off of it or you utilize it for you know banking or finance or credit decisioning. And it only lasts for a specific period of time. And while you're utilizing that specific model or calculation or mathematics, stats, whatever you wanna call it, uh, you're gonna have to be working behind the scenes to generate something new to replace that once that one starts kind of failing. So again, there's different types of fail rates, there's different horizons and portfolios and investings and you know banking and all that. So you have to consider that. 
But imagine you come up with a paper like, I don't know, the Black Shoals model. So like your Fisher Black or Myron Shoals or even uh, Robert Merton here, right? So you could be one of the three. Uh, if you come out with this amazing paper and the entire academic community sees it and it's groundbreaking and hedge funds love it, uh, you know what's going to happen? You're probably going to get a really good job offer to go work somewhere at a hedge fund because you are obviously really smart. So having fame, having publicity, it allows you to speak, get paid to speak. It's going to lead to job opportunities. Uh, so in general, publishing in that sort of sense is going to be very advantageous. Now, that being said, you don't see this happening very often. One being there's not really that many groundbreaking models or research or anything such as magnitudes like the Black Shoals, for example. Um, even when there are somewhat breakthroughs and things, a lot of times they, I don't know, they're not really publicized too much where everyone already knows about it and it's kind of like a dead kind of paper. So a lot of times ideas and knowledge are known in the industry before it's even published. So people have been using it for a while. Uh, but in general here, right, you're gonna want fame for it, but most quants are also so busy getting paid to do a day job. So that's something I don't think a lot of quants realize. You're so busy doing your day job, you're not gonna have time to go do with all this extra research, right? It's extremely rare. And there are people that do it, don't get me wrong. Um, but it burns you out really quick. You kind of run out of momentum. You're just tired from your day job. And so at the end of the day, guess what you don't want to see when you get home? I don't want to see stats, right? You want to go on vacation. You want to spend time with your family and your friends and do other things. So again, this is one reason you don't see this. Now, of course, there are non-compete clauses when traders or more specifically, not traders, but quants leave because quants actually know and understand the strategy from the ground up. And so when that actually happens, right, you don't want them to take that strategy and be able to utilize it somewhere else. Um, again, they have years on these contracts. A lot of times companies think about how much time, you know, kind of strategies benefit them and whatnot. And a lot of these so-called secret sauce uh, come down to really just odd generic things. Like, for example, we found a new data source that nobody else has. Uh, we found a way to harvest data that no one else has. Um, right now in the quant community, I think it's kind of stupid, but a lot of these firms are chasing new data sources, thinking they've extracted everything out of their past data. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, trendy thing to do. Uh, but in general, there's going to be more value added, I think, from the way I look at things, uh, and the fact of just building strong models. So I would argue easily over 90% of all models used in quantitative finance or even traditional finance are wrong. Um, so no surprise here. It shouldn't be a surprise to many of you. Um, and I say this a lot of times and say the fundamentals, and that's what I'm hoping this quant finance discussion board somewhat turns into. Uh, the fundamentals, to be honest with you, are not understood. I don't care if you have a master's, a PhD from the best universities in the world. Often the industry kind of hollows out your knowledge, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, and also just an education is not enough. So I say that all the time, people think I'm crazy. Uh, but even if you had a seven year PhD in the United States, a two years master below that and a four year undergrad, uh, all saying in some sort of mix of like, let's say you started with a math undergrad, uh, computer science masters and like a statistics PhD, uh, it's not enough, right? It, it's never enough. Uh, you need to go to the industry, you need to learn more, you need to have dirty data, you need to get your hands dirty, you need to see how markets really work and move. You're never going to see this in an academic setting. And the other main reason is it doesn't matter if you go to the world's best university with the best professors and even industry practitioners. Uh, you know, let's say seven years of PhD, so seven, and then two puts us at nine, and then four puts us at 13. Even 13 years of study, if it was only solely on these topics, it's not enough. There's way too much information out there. There's way too much information uh, to learn all of it, right? You you could die and spend your whole career studying and researching on it. You're never going to reach uh, the edges of all these different topics and areas. So again, there's a lot of information. Now that leads me to the modeling component here, why I think the industry somewhat hollows out your academic knowledge and abilities. Um, so when you start in academia, this is kind of a problem here, uh, academics, are always very by the book, right? They do things by the textbook, by the paper, and they take these really nice, pretty, clean data sets. And this is why you typically don't do a lot of data cleaning in undergrad or grad school, unless you're doing like web scraping or some other nonsense. But uh, you end up taking uh, basically really clean data and you run it through a model and you go, oh, look, right? And a regression works, right? I ran an MLS regression, I ran, I, I don't know, a Ceremax, I don't know, Garch model, or I did some sort of stochastic, I don't know, volatility model to do whatever. 
Anyways, the point being is that you have this really pretty world. When you jump into the industry though, the issue with that is that that's not how the real world works. And so those models, while it was so easy to pick the correct model and so easy to fit the model and so easy to find how everything worked, um, when you actually get into the real world, they don't work. And often you don't know all the different layers and routes and paths and processes of going through model development because they don't really teach it that well in school. And so you don't know where to go next. Or if your test fails, you don't know exactly what to do. And sometimes there's not a really easy solution. So you have to get very creative. But to do that, you need to understand the statistical mathematical theory behind your modeling so that you can actually figure out ways to kind of fudge your data and manipulate it in a way that you understand it. You can make modifications without sweeping too much under the rug and you can come up with a solution. And so when I say this, right, I say the industry is not building models right, right? That's the big failure. We have a mass education issue in quant finance, even with requiring a master's and PhD here. And people say, oh, Demetri, you just don't know what you're talking about. And I recently had a subscriber message me and said, you know, you mentioned that a few years ago. And I thought, you know, you're a little off your rocker here. And they said, you know, I've been working in the industry for two years now after I graduated. And you're completely right. I'm actually shocked. Um, so, and people think I'm crazy. So I try to bring this up here. Uh, there are other books on this. So I don't know if you can see these books or not, but uh, Models Behaving Badly by Emmanuel Derman. He talks about model failures, people building models, being over-reliant on models. Again, people don't know what they're doing. Um, the Black Swan, so super famous book in the finance world uh, by Nisan Talab, of course. Uh, the same thing. He points out a lot of the issues, a lot of the failures. I've really been highly critical of this book when I did a book review. But there are things in here that are just like super cringeworthy on the fact of like you can't believe people would actually be doing it this way, like the normal distribution and how people overly rely on it. Um, and it's important. I'm not going to go on that tangent route of stats maybe that can be on the uh, LinkedIn discussion board. Uh, but in general, this book points out other issues we consistently see. And if you're a data scientist and you want to come at it from a data science perspective, uh, Marcos Lopez de Prado's Advances in Financial Machine Learning as well, which I've also done a book review on and I've also been somewhat critical on. Uh, again, these books have all done a great job at pointing out a lot of the issues we consistently see uh, in the industry. And so all three of these authors have been somewhat critical of the industry as well. Um, I'm not new here in this doing this, but people just don't know how to put the basics together. And it's really quite unfortunate, I think, in the quant finance realm. Uh, I don't even know where to start on how to blame that. I mean, part of my entire YouTube channel is trying to figure out how to educate people better so that we can build better models so we don't have as many issues with us. Uh, but to be honest with you, there's not really, in my opinion at least, there's not a lot of secrets in quant finance. Uh, there are a lot of really advanced tools. There are a lot of really basic tools. And I don't think people are building models solidly by looking at the tests. And so kind of back to that academic versus industry thing, uh, when you come from academia, you follow the book. When you go to the industry, you can't solve problems quickly and easy. And so what a lot of industry practitioners do and get in the habit of, because they're not you know, educated and trained properly, um, is they actually end up just ignoring all these assumptions and statistics and don't test things. And they just build models and then they use the model and it seems like it's working great. You know, we're 2017, 2018, 2019, the market's just going sky high. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, we're in a bull market here. Like we've been running for years here. So it's kind of, I don't know, in a way it's hard to lose money because everything's going up. And then we have inflation, of course, which I've talked about in a different video uh, that drives prices as well. So everything should be moving forward. So it's kind of obvious that everybody should be making money in some way, shape or form. Uh, again, this comes down to this whole criticism of the industry, how you measure your gains, how you measure it against the market, looking at risk adjusted returns, for example. All these things play into how well your markets are working. And the big question that I'm gonna throw out there as a risk manager is going to be, so when a market crisis hits in you know, sometime in the future, whether it's a year, six months, 10 years, whatever, uh, how well are these models gonna hold up? And are you gonna be solvent or liquid at the end of this, right? Where are you gonna be sitting at? A lot of people don't know that. Um, so these are kind of the things on why quants would share ideas and information. Um, from that standpoint though, there's no magic bullet. Like there's no silver bullet here on like a solution. Like this is the secret formula that makes money and it's gonna solve the world. It does not exist. I can promise you that there's no fancy equation out there. Uh, even the Black-Scholes model, for example, is not a fancy equation that just guarantees you the price of an option. There are assumptions behind it and they don't always work and you have to create other workarounds and models and 
people are irrational a lot of times too, which kind of plays into these markets. Um, but there's not really a secret sauce, I don't think. And even when firms do have secrets, of course there are things uh, that banks and investing firms have that are somewhat proprietary to the way they do things. Uh, a lot of times it comes down to data sources, it comes down to uh, the sorts of techniques and model adjustments they make to these. But all of those aren't going to be some top secret, new, academically groundbreaking thing. It's really just going to be, you have a few smart people that did it correctly. And often when those people leave your firm, um, those ideas kind of decay and people forget them. So it's kind of a challenge here. So anyways, before I ramble too far on this, that's why quant share information, um, my best conversations uh, with quants in general are about like stats and math. Right, so a lot of people think quant finance is all about finance and markets and trading and algorithms. Uh, so from my perspective, no, it's it's really not. Uh, I'm more excited in talking about the model itself and the statistical assumptions and how they work and why they don't work. And like, I don't know, even for like data science right now, we're kind of running through that. Uh, we're talking about the assumptions that are broken behind it, but it's just pure data science. We're not really talking like finance. So anyways, that's kind of my two cents on this. If you guys really do want to get involved in some of these discussions, give some feedback, ask some questions, I don't know, be in this whole community as well. Uh, don't forget to join the community below. If you found this video helpful or this channel helpful, uh, I'll put a link below as well to my Ko-Fi, which is basically buy me a coffee. For $3, you can give me a little thank you. It helps kind of push and promote this channel and keep it going. So anyways, thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.